Ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for tuning in to the, the latest installment of UD's webinars. Uh, my name is Ian Evans, and obviously I will be introducing uh, Nan Whaley today. So a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a 2020 grad at, from the University of Dayton, and I'm also a current graduate student at the University of Dayton studying, or will attain my master's in May of 2021 in communication. Um, for those of you who also didn't know or watched uh, the latest docu uh, University of Dayton documentary, I was also the narrator and head writer of Dayton's Darkest Summer. <laughs> the I, knew, I, I knew I recognized <laughs> your voice, Ian. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. But I, me, me and as long as well as my classmates, we really appreciate everyone for tuning in. And thank you to you as well, Mary Nan Whaley, for um, taking the time to interview, um, to, to interview for that documentary as well. We really appreciate it. Um, before we begin the actual webinar, here are a few items. We are recording today's session and we'll upload it to UD Digital. Um, and thank you to everyone who submitted questions in advance. And we have we received a number of questions and we'll do our best to address them as they see fit. And today's session will focus on leadership skills that help to lead during challenging times. Um, before we get into all the questions, let me go through, you know, a little bit of brief history of Mayor Nan Willey real quick. So, Nan Willey is proud to choose Dayton as her home. Originally from Indiana, Nan attended the University of Dayton, where she graduated in 1998 with a degree in chemistry and a minor in political science, and soon settled in the Five Oaks neighborhood where she and her husband Sam reside today. Her career is distinguished by her commitment to public service, civic involvement, and interest in government. First elected to the Dayton City Commission in 2005, Nan was the youngest woman ever chosen for a commission seat. She was proud to be elected as Dayton's mayor in 2013 by a double digit majority. As mayor, she has focused on the areas of community development, manufacturing, and women and children. Nan is a national leader among her peers, serving as the second vice president for the U.S. Conference of Mayors, as well as the chair of the International Committee for the conference. Nan is also a founding board member for the Ohio's Mayor Alliance, a bipartisan coalition of Ohio's, 30s, of Ohio's 30 largest cities. Nan has also been committed to the political process in local, state, and national elections. While in college, she served as Ohio chair of the College Democrats. She currently serves as second vice president of the National Conference of Democratic Mayors. Additionally, she is a four-time delegate to the Democratic National Convention. So Mayor Whaley, welcome. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Thank you, Ian, and uh, just a great job on that um, documentary that you all put together. Uh, uh, I was uh, excited that we uh, for the one year anniversary of the shooting, we got to be, you know, use it as part of that week remembrance. And I thought uh, the work you did uh, and your team did on it, I think you told Dayton's story last year pretty powerfully. And I get a little nervous sometimes when people go to tell that story, right? Because uh, it's something very important and close to all of us here in Dayton. But you guys did a great job. Thank you so much. And um, I don't even know if they're in here, but I, I as well as them, definitely thank you for taking the time to interview with us. And, you know, we wanted to put out there that obviously, you know, the day, <clears throat> Dayton is more than a shooting or, a tur or tornadoes or tragedies. It's a city of resilience. And I honestly think you are a, a testament to that. Um, so before we actually go into the, you know, um, all the questions people have been asking, we have a little bit uh, of, a, I guess you could say a lightning round oh. um, before we go into your leadership style. And right. uh, we want to learn more about your time at UD with a few questions. Okay. So where are you from originally and what brought you to University of Dayton anyway? So I'm actually uh, originally from Indiana. I went to an all girls Catholic boarding school in Southern Indiana called Oldenburg Academy of the Immaculate Conception. It's a mouthful. Or, um, uh, they, I graduated there with 44 girls and uh, UD recruited out of there. And this was back, I'm getting you know older Ian, so it was back in the time when you could, um, uh, college cost wasn't too, uh, too hard like it is now. And um, my parents said, you can go to Dayton if you can get it to be as much as Indiana University. And so I got a scholarship and never had been to Dayton in my life. 
didn't really even know where it was besides it was someplace in Ohio and um, and um, came and went to the to the university. I actually like I, like you said in my intro, I was a chemistry major and um, uh, played in the symphony orchestra as well while I was at UD. Okay, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting journey for sure. Yeah. Um, did you ever have a favorite place you lived on campus? For me, I know it's direct. I love to go work out. I mean, I can't play basketball now, you know, due to the pandemic. Yeah. But did you have a place, favorite place on campus? Um, well, you know, I was an RA my junior and senior year, and I lived in Stewart Hall those two years. And so I really liked... Um, I remember I was the RA for Six Adele, and I, I just really liked the community that we had between the the whole floor there. So if I'd have to say, like, my favorite uh, place in memory is probably Six Adele at Stewart Hall. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, for one, I lived in Founders. I love Founders. But yes. I've, I've met a great ton of people from Stewart, too. Yeah, see, so I did my freshman uh, year at Marycrest, so I spent all of my time in freshman dorms, really. <laughs> My sophomore year, I got a break and went to VWK, but otherwise I was in a freshman dorm all uh, three of the four years. <laughs> <laughs> I can definitely identify with that. Um, so at your time at UD, were you involved with you know, any clubs or organizations on campus? Yeah, well, not surprisingly, I started with a group of friends, the College Democrats on campus. And so it had been pretty dormant and we, um, I don't think it had been around for a few years. And so we started it back up and it's really what got me involved in um, politics here in Dayton. So that was the group I was super engaged with. Well, fair enough. I mean, look where you are now. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> and I but, still um, stay in touch with college Democrats at UD. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so the they, connection stays strong. Stay strong. It stays strong. Love to see it. Um, so what, you know, what was your thought process in deciding, you know, post-graduation, like what, what made you stay at Dayton? Now for me, I'm originally from Maryland and I've been saying to a lot of friends, it would take me a lot of persuasion to stay in Dayton post-graduation. So what made you stay? Well, for me, I mean, I, what I did when I was in um, college, because I got involved in politics, I took, I took bus, a bus downtown uh, to Democratic headquarters and started volunteering. And I got really active uh, the year that I was, um, like a junior in college was the Bill Clinton um, re-election for president. And so got really active there and got to know the people of Dayton that were active in community and active in government and um, really liked it. You know, the things that you talk about the city, uh, it being, you know, a gritty city, a resilient city. I felt that then. Um, and the community also like really um, gets excited about young people and young people staying in, in Dayton. And so I felt really wanted here uh, and that I could make a difference. Dayton is a town, it's not too big, it's not too small. Uh, so you can really make an impact. And so I felt that was the place that, you know, I felt, I felt at home here um, because, because of that. So um, I would say to you, you, sh you know, I hope you go downtown, I mean, post COVID and get out of what we call the bubble of UD and um, get to know some folks because Ian, we'd love you to stay in Dayton. That's one of the things we like, we like to do is to keep UD students in Dayton. Who knows, maybe I might be convinced down the road. I still have, hopefully, however long we're here, I hope we, we stay for the rest of the semester and come back next semester too. But who knows? We'll see what happens. I hope uh, so. Along. I hope so. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, you've been, you know, the mayor of Dayton for seven years, um, and you have definitely led the city through times of growth and times of great heartache. Um, in the last 15 months, Dayton has faced real challenges. As a community, it would have been easy to give up. And as a leader, you know, you could have bowed out. And instead, your guidance has helped Dayton to be known as a city of resilience. So we see, we've received some great questions from today's attendees that will help us, you know, kind of explore what it's like to be a leader and how that guides you as a mayor, whether it be past, present, or maybe even future. So some, some of the questions we've gotten. So what it, has it been like leading through the last 12 to 15 months? Well, I mean, it's certainly nothing I really expected to do. I mean, I was elected, as you mentioned, in, uh, as mayor in 2013, and I served eight years before as a city commissioner. So I've been at City Hall now. This is my 15th year at City Hall. Uh, and um, the first term was one where we got to be very proactive. We passed um, high quality preschool for every four-year-old across the city, really start, you know, drove the agenda about what we wanted to do on investment and growth in the city and have had great success. Some of that 
even happened in the last 15 months. Um, for example, the arcade effort that the University of Dayton is working with the city on. Uh, so, um, so the first term was, you know, very proactive and driving an agenda. And this past, you know, 15 months, you know, um, uh, the hate group that came to town, the tornadoes, the um, uh, the shooting, and now COVID, it's, 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 it's a more defensive positioning. And, and, you know, we, it's not to say that everything was perfect in that first term. I mean, we still had a pretty terrific opioid challenge um, that year and um, in, in those years, and it's still a challenge for us today, but we were still, we still had time and space to be more proactive. And so I think that's been, that's been the challenge of this, this leadership work. Also, you know, we haven't even mentioned, you know, the civil unrest that we're experiencing in our communities and across the country. And so there's this huge opportunity that's kind of sat in front of Dayton uh, for legitimate reform between police and community. And so, you know, we want to take that opportunity. Um, what I notice right now in local, um, local government is we don't have a, as much of um, a say in what's going on because the national issues just kind of like lay on us really heavily. And so you have to respond to these national issues. So you don't get to choose your agenda nearly as much. I haven't gotten to choose the agenda nearly as much as I did in the first term. That's not a bad thing. Like, I mean, I think some of the things that we've, you know, been given the opportunity to work on because of the things that have happened to Dayton have been really meaningful and obviously urgent to the community. Uh, but it's certainly not um, not what I thought I was getting into when I swore I swore took the swear oath off, oath, oath of office swearing in for the second term. Right, one hundred percent. I mean, no one can predict you know this big of whether it be pandemic or um, obviously shootings happen all the time, but you never really thought it would hit close to home until it does. Um, right. But yeah, but honestly, I mean, your leadership through all of it has been you know outstanding to watch, whether it be from where I'm from or even here, it's been outstanding. Um, so obviously you went, you know, to UD, like we've explained multiple times before, how has, or if it has, how has your, you know, Marianist education shaped your leadership style? Yeah, so, I mean, I think, uh, when I was, a, when I was a junior in, um, at, at Dayton, I took leadership building community with brother Ray Fitz, who was the former, uh, president, two presidents ago, uh, I think the building's named after Brother Ray, right? Like the Fit Center and stuff. So um, uh, that was actually the first um, time I even made it to a neighborhood in Dayton, which was the McFarland neighborhood in West Dayton. Uh, and really this idea of servant leadership and uh, leadership um, uh, with the, the community mind and the um, servant, the servant leadership style uh, was really uh, embedded in, in that year during my time at UD. Um, I'll say this though, I mean, one of the things I think uh, that is important is, you know, that I, th I, I completely um, agree with the Marina style of servant leadership, but I do, th I do believe too, and um, I, I was in high school, um, that was a Franciscan school, Franciscan nuns, and they, they have, um, I think, a more of a, a, a belief in like impact, um, uh, social justice impact in a way that's uh, more aggressive than the Marina style, right? So it was interesting to me to like uh, be educated in both the Franciscan and Marianist traditions and take pieces of both of them um, to, to build, you know, their pieces of my leadership today. Uh, so um, I think that's been really, really helpful. Uh, the Marianist tradition of, of UD has been key. It's, it's key to Dayton, frankly, you know, just, just as um, uh, the University of Dayton has Dayton in its name, the Marianist tradition runs through our neighborhoods and in our communities because Dayton uh, and the work that they've done now for decades and decades um, and that, that idea of servant leadership, I hear it from like the NAACP members to community leaders that are running neighborhoods. So I, I see it, I see it a lot across, across Dayton, um, not just in my style, but in others as well. All right. Love to see that. Um, so obviously, you know, Dayton has had a very tough year. Um, for some, you know, say it would be easy, you know, to throw in the towel, but, you know, instead the Dayton community has shown how resilient we are. What do you think, or why do you think our community d 
doesn't give up time and time again. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the reason why I was called to, you know, really be here. Um, uh, so the Dayton is a, the history of Dayton is one that has been built on this, uh, this innovation, the Wright brothers, uh, Patterson, who created NCR, uh, Charles Kettering, the inventor of the um, starting engine, every woman in America and the world thanks him, you know, because they don't have to crank the car up and just turn it. Like, you know, he's very, I always say Charles Kettering, Kettering is probably the most, you know, pro-woman uh, uh, father of Dayton. Um, uh, so, you know, we have this innovation, but also uh, we have this grit of, of really making these items as well. To, you know, today, Ermel Frey's, for example, uh, created the pop top can here. To date, in Dayton, those machines are made in Dayton and sent across the world. So all the companies that have pop top cans have a machine that comes from Dayton that makes that, that piece. And, you know, that, that kind of engineering and uh, manufacturing is one that figures it out and oh it's my dog louie um is uh is one that figures it out and then also um uh puts like a lot of like grease and effort into it right mm -hmm. and so uh because of our blue collar nature so it's an interesting place in the sense that it's gritty because of the blue collar nature but it has this like stick to itness of solving a problem uh, per capita, and because of the University of Dayton too, is a big engineering school. I mean, I think per capita we're one of the like highest number of engineers in the country, both because of UD and Wright Patterson. So I think that that those those kind of uh, pieces in our community make us very gritty. Um, also, like I think too, the other thing I think because of where we sit in the crossroads of America, I found this across the country that everybody has a Dayton story or know something about Dayton or, you know, whether it's the Flyers or, um, or, you know, the base, a lot of people move through Dayton uh, for our size of town and um, uh, makes us uh, play. And I think I love that this is the other thing I love about our city is we play kind of above out of our class because uh, we're not, when I tell people how big we are population wise, they're like, oh, it's not really that big, but we have this outsized um uh national view and i think that has a lot to do with the first four frankly playing here uh the university wright patterson air force base we have these stellar um uh pieces for our community that communities our size typically don't have right and i've always said the one like when people ask me why i went to dayton um yeah, why'd i you said go? You know, it was the most affordable for me, one, but yeah. two, I mean, it's a different type of feeling being on, you know, a campus that's, and that's technically smaller than most, like I'm from Maryland, Maryland's a big campus, same thing with Ohio State, Penn State, I was looking at those two, they're really big campuses, I wanted a place where I could feel at home, honestly, and Dayton provided that for me. Um, also, uh, like you said it multiple times, the city of Dayton has a lot of grit, and I, I love that characteristic about the city. But you also mentioned another thing, um, the way the city handles and solves problems. So my next question that has been asked is, you know, what are the top things you consider when making a difficult decision, whether it be to a problem or, you know, something like that? Yeah, so I, I, what I've learned about myself uh, as, um, as mayor is I really do enjoy um, leading and seeing through problems where you can bring people together to get an outcome. I mean, I really, really um, enjoy, and enjoy that. So, I mean, I think one of the things that I try to do is when we have an issue, it's, you know, what kind of impact can I make both as mayor and as, um, as the city, as a city organization? What's, what's our impact in that? How can we make our impact greater? Uh, and then um, what's the path to get more people on our side for the other side, uh, for, for the win-win. Um, and, you know, um, you have to like, you, you have to be okay with some risk in those, in those decisions too. Uh, you know, one of the things I don't like, I mean, I, th I actually think a lot of elected officials aren't very risky. Uh, because they're worried about their next election or they're worried about, you know, making folks angry. Um, and I, like, I, you know, I'm human. Of course, I want people to like me. I'm not um, like that. 
but I, I, I think I know the difference between being liked and respected. And so what I've noticed, you know, I am a progressive liberal Democrat and um, um, I tease a lot of people because this region is more conservative. And um, I even just said today, I said, you know, I'm a lot of people's only liberal friend. And they're like, you are Nan, like you, you are it. Um, and I think I like, I, I come from a place that is very conservative too. And I think I actually like challenging um, people's thoughts about what people think is the only answer. And so that gives opportunity to, to take on new challenges and then make a great impact. I'm gonna give one example last year on one that I was surprised. And sometimes you just have to do, like you're doing it and you think there's no path. And so um, last year, uh, the Dayton Daily News was bought by a hedge fund, Apollo. And I was really nervous about this. Um, I know that um, typically, you know, journalism is being cannibalized. Uh, it is in a disruption market. Um, it is not. Um, it is not a place where you, they were printing money. Because basically, when Jim Cox, the former, you know, the founder of the paper, um, little known fact, um, governor of Ohio, and um, candidate for president of the United States in 1920, 100 years ago, got beat by Warren Harding uh, from Marion, Ohio. It was the Battle of Ohio. Big mistake. They didn't. They didn't elect Cox anyway. Um, so, you know, so I was thinking about, um, I was very worried about the paper um, being bought by a hedge fund. I was, and that happened. Uh, hedge funds typically don't, aren't interested in keeping papers going. They're taking it for the assets. Uh, and um, this had happened to cities across the country. Dayton wasn't unique to this. This is a national issue affecting us locally again. But here's what was different. Um, uh, a, I called a group of uh, community leaders and said, hey, I'm really nervous about this. Are you nervous about this? And, they, and there were folks that might know other people and they were like, yeah, let's check on this. And the next thing I know, this group had put together like 50 folks to start educating the community on what this hedge fund purchase would mean. And um, because of the way the media was working in Dayton, it was all um, owned by the same person and that's illegal. So the FEC said they got to split up and Apollo said, oh no, no, we'll just keep it. And we'll only print the paper three days a week. We'll only put, which is terrible. Like Dayton, this region, only having a one, you know, a paper three days a week, like that hurts government. It hurts transparency. It hurts sunlight. Um, my point is, I like to fight with the paper. Who would I fight with every day? This would be a huge tragedy. Uh, and also, democracy does die in darkness. That is just, you know, it is a huge journalism is a key part to democracy. So I said, okay, well, we have like no prayer of winning this, but we've got to say something. We've got to say something about this and we've got to work with these community members. Well, the Cox, uh, the Cox media who owned the paper before couldn't stomach the idea of the paper going to four days a week. They bought that paper back and now it's still at seven days a week. And if not for that community activism, if not, I told the community members, I think we're on a Don Quixote mission. I don't think this is going to work but it's still, it's so important to our community, we have to say something. So here's a place that I had no authority. I don't own anything. I'm the mayor of the city of Dayton. Community members come together. We use our voice to make a difference. And I think that's the best, the best part of the job is when you can make impact, particularly in places that you didn't think you could. Right, I mean, and you know, sometimes those risks, those risks, especially for, you know, these types of decisions, whether it be with newspapers or, you know, even economics or even financially speaking, you know, sometimes those risks um, have high rewards. And in that example, you know, it, it worked out well. So, you know, with that being said, sometimes you don't see challenges, you know, come your way, whether it be with a new job or, you know, even in, especially in politics, there's some things you just don't see coming a mile away. So what do you wish you would have known before coming before becoming mayor that could have prepared you better for the challenges you'd face, if any. Um, I I wish I one of the things I've learned as mayor, in particular the past two years, is, and I mean I have grown a tremendous amount in the job, um, personally and I think professionally, is, um, and I mean I I don't I don't have any regrets about my first few years. When, when you become mayor, and I, I've talked to other mayors across the country, and uh, another point, Ian, I think mayors are the best um, 
like it's the best job as far as elected officials were a special sort because you're on the ground but then you also have to like kind of look at the big picture and there's not many places that, that you can do that in elected office like either legislate or you know you're you know too big and you don't get to touch people so um but when you're first mayor and uh like i was saying other mayors have said this too you you are so excited about being mayor that you just want to do the job all the time like i can't explain all the time like so if you have something you really love and you just you know it's only going to last for so long because you're you know you're not going to be in these positions forever so i mean i was like i just i just want to i can't stop working i just want to work all the time i have so much so many ideas so many things i want to do and in the second term and because of the challenges that came our way as a city like i really had to learn how to recharge and how to like take care of myself on that recharging and um be more introspective and um, I would never thought like I don't and I, it might not be the case that many people take a job like mayor and it makes them more introspective, but that I'm grateful for that. Um, it's made me slow like the, the the tragedies that have happened in Dayton have made me slow down a bit and kind of like, you know, um, not move so quickly. I still move pretty fast, but um, I think there's a thoughtfulness from these that I, I think and I, I, I would never have had it at the beginning. It's, you know, I think the process of having the position. Yeah. Um, self-care isn't selfish. I've heard it multiple times. So it's you know, got to get away. Got to yeah. get away from, from time to time. Self-care isn't selfish. I love 100%. it. hundred percent. Is that, um, is that your line? Do I get to say like Ian Evans said oh, that? Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, Please oh. don't. I've, I've heard it from someone else. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I've never heard that. That's great. But yeah, just keep, definitely keep that in mind. I've used that um, multiple times, especially uh, as you know, college students, especially in this time. You know, you got to step away from time to time. Um, you mentioned earlier, and we'll probably talk about it later on, but um, social injustices and you know inequalities. There's also a big deal of gender inequality as well. So another question we got was, you know, as a woman, do you find your male contemporaries take you as seriously as they should? Uh, I th I think so. Um, uh, th first of all, like of the top, I think 200 cities in the country, only like 38 of us are women. So it's pretty, it's a pretty low number. Although there's more coming on, like you know, Keisha Lance Bottoms of Atlanta, Miro Bowser of DC. Uh, you know, we've gotten quite a few. Paige Cognetti from Scranton. So um, this past couple of years, it's been Lori Lightfoot out of Chicago. So you know, we're getting more women mayors. Um, I like, and, and like in the, the big six cities in Ohio, Dayton, Akron, Toledo, Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, I'm the only woman mayor. Um, so um, uh, they, they seem to respect me. Um, the, you know, we're all about this. A lot of us are the same age. And so I think, you know, we're Gen Xers kind of coming into this. And so I think, you know, uh, younger and younger people seem to be more, more open to the gender uh, disparity and recognizing that. Um, but like, I got to take my space. I mean, I think that's the, the other thing. I think you can tell I'm not a shrinking violet here. And so um, I, I don't think that any of them would have the nerve to not respect me, I think, because um, I, I would definitely give them the what for. But um, um, I haven't, I haven't experienced that too much. I haven't, I, I know what you're talking about. Like I've experienced it not with mayors, but with other people where they pat me on the head. Uh, but, you know, there's an advantage to being underestimated as well. And um, I, I'm okay with, I, like, I, some, sometimes, you know, you like to be underestimated a little bit. So um, I appreciate that sometimes too. Right. I mean, I, I love that. I mean, especially because, you know, I, for one, and a lot, a lot of multitude of people have a great deal of respect for you. Um, I just couldn't see anyone who doesn't. I know it's biased, obviously, but it's it's very interesting to see that other type of viewpoint. Um, we talked, obviously, self-care isn't selfish. We talked about that. You also mentioned, you know, you took a step back from everything that was happening at one point. Uh, the next question we had was, how do you maintain work-life balance, you know, the work and life balance during this, this time? So COVID has been really interesting for me. Okay, so before, personally, it's been very difficult for the city. It's they have terrible decisions, bad choices all around. But personally, you know, before I would travel a lot on behalf of the city, um, or for U.S. Conference of Mayors, or you know, for um, political events, and um, 
and like nearly every weekend was like working, you know, in some sense, either politically or for the city. And um, when COVID happened, like everything stopped. And um, a couple of things that was really hard for me because one of the great things I loved about the mayor's job is it's different every day. And while it's still different, like I don't talk to you every day, Ian, but I'm still like in the same room every day, right? right? It's my office at home or my office at work. I really don't go out anywhere, which was a big adjustment. Cause I mean, I would do around, you know, uh, probably 20, 25 events a week. Um, so if you're doing that kind of clip and then you just stop and you know, you're just doing 20 to 25 zooms a week, it's a little different. Uh, so I had to do a couple of things during this time. First, I had to exercise and you know, you can't go to a gym during the beginning. So I've started doing yoga at home every day. So I've done yoga at home every day since April 1st, which has been great. Um, also, you heard my dog bark, Louie. Uh, he is a Humane Society rescue dog from October. At last year, I was like, I really, you know, last year was tough. I was like, I, my husband and I negotiated a dog. I needed a dog. Uh, there's that line in politics, if you want a friend, you know, if you want a friend in politics, get a dog. You know? <laughs> Um, so Louie came to us, he's the standard poodle and, um, uh, I walk him every single morning. So the morning is really important to me and it's the way I kind of reset my day. Uh, and then the other thing I do during COVID is every month, I think of like a personal goal that I can focus on. Uh, cause you know, I, uh, one of my hard times, I don't know how other people feel, but it's hard to get stuff done, right? You just are kind of treading water. And so. I was like, I, at the beginning of it, I was like, how am I going to mark this time so it's been meaningful that I've done things that um, are, mean, because it's, it's really difficult, the city with the choices you have are very limited, but you know, what could I do that could be meaningful for me to learn and to grow? And so um, I've done those things and that's been really helpful for me on self-care. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. Definitely, especially in a, in a position of power and in a position where you can, you know, impact changes, definitely. Uh, important to make sure your mental is is definitely sane. I mean, granted, it's easier said than done, but it's definitely awesome to see that, you know, you're taking those uh, procedures, I guess you could say, and yeah. making sure, you know, you take time to yourself. Yeah. Are you doing mm -hmm. things? What are you doing for yourself? So, Self-care isn't selfish. Yeah. I think that might be the, the tagline of the whole yeah, webinar. Exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> um, so I, you know, shameless plug, I, I, have a sports podcast and I also have a sports blog. So granted it was kind of tough when sports weren't really happening. Yeah, what did you do? So I, um, well, so Michael Jordan's documentary, The Last yep. Dance came out and oh, I was all over that. Um, I started with that. And then I also kind of talked about how, well, I mean, sadly, you know, George Floyd, you know, was murdered as well. So I talked about that on my podcast as well. So I kind of, it was weird because I transitioned from mainly just talking about sports to talking more about, you know, the social injustices and everything that was going on in the world. And interestingly enough, people actually wanted to hear it. So, sure. and then I, the, I did the sports blog and all that too. What's the name of your podcast? So it's called The Impact, believe it or not, with Ian Evans. And the blog is based off of the podcast called uh, Impact Sports Media. So we write articles about whether it be sports or how athletes influence sports and like on or off fields, courts or whatever. So, yeah. Oh, check it out. How often do you put it out? Oh, so I do a podcast every week. I have me and my co-founder, Peter Burtnett. I don't know if he's in here or not, but we try and put out articles um, every week and we're trying still trying to recruit some more writers we have I think roughly two or three other writers that contribute to the site as well so Very cool. yeah uh, it gets it gets a lot of the stress off but well, um, I, yeah. that's 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 awesome and uh, very uh, very cool the I haven't watched the Jordan documentary yet but I am going to watch it because even people that my husband's a big NBA fan but uh, that was the period of time I was at Dayton so like you know, I kind of lived, you know, through that time as, as a young person and Jordan was such a, a cultural impact in the, in the country. And, and for us, you know, it was, uh, it was key. So I'm going to definitely watch that, but that's good stuff. Okay. I'm going to add you to my podcast listening. Okay. I'm going to tell you now I have a podcast. Oh, okay. You know this? I did not actually. Mm -hmm. My podcast is called carry as you climb. And I interview uh, other women leaders about their leadership styles. So it's the whole idea that you have to carry women, you know, you have to climb the ladder, but you also have to bring women with you and carry them as you climb the ladder. 
I, I love that title. I really do. That's that's amazing. Now, see, now I have to add my that's yeah, my list okay, now. We did the <laughs> I love it. This has been great. That's awesome. Um, but you mentioned, you know, before, especially, um, you know, before Corona, everything was just speeding up, rapidly going. And then once it really hit and we knew the magnitude of it, everything stopped. Mm -hmm. So and some people would actually say that some civic dialogue has stopped as well. So how can individuals discuss opposing ideas and issues while being civil? That's the next question we have. Look, this is a real issue for um, our democracy, and I'm very nervous about it, frankly. Um, the, the, the screen, no matter how you cut it, is, is, a, is, a, is a barrier. And while I've been amazed at the technology we've been able to innovate around it to stay in communication, it's still not as deep as face-to-face -face and in-person. And we add to the fact that we were already um, deeply um, divided on how we were living to get living as, as communities. Um, and that, and it seems to me more living in like our belief systems, not our religious belief, but our political belief systems than anything else that's really a, a exasperated civic dialogue. I mean, I, I forget the poll number, but like, I think it was like a quarter in the 1970s asked, like if you were a Democrat and your daughter brought home a Republican to marry, how would you feel? And mm -hmm. only a quarter said like, I'd hate that. It's like 80% now. I mean, it is like, you know, um, uh, your political belief is more important than any of your other belief systems. And I think that's because the civic dialogue has really um, broken down. Um, and, I, and I think um, social media has a real responsibility and the social media um, companies have a responsibility to it. I think uh, Twitter is doing a better job in trying to ask those questions than Facebook. I think Facebook is failing miserably at this. Um, and, um, and we, um, and I think the other problem is, is that our politics is now rewarded for extreme behavior. Mm -hmm. And before politics used to be rewarded for coming together, um, or have the fights are just so, um, high stakes, um, ridiculous that, um, uh, it can be, it can be quite depressing. And I mean, qu I mean quite honestly, some days so broken that I'm like, can I make a difference in this anymore? I mean, I love, I love the belief in democracy. It's a core value of mine. I believe that people coming together and having uh, collective power and, and having voice to their government is so important, but I'm very concerned about the brokenness of it from um, the extreme amount of money in, 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 in politics today is, is nearly crippling it. Right, a hundred percent. Going off of that, kind of actually yeah it definitely goes off of that how does Dayton move from being more actually move toward actually being more inclusive of all cultures races creeds etc yes so Dayton uh for all of its beauty and uh great efforts it is still a highly segregated city uh in the midwestern sense of the word uh, uh when the great migration happened from the Jim the Jim Crow South um, policies were put in place to uh, allow white people to live one place, white Protestants live one place, white Catholics live somewhere else, black people live somewhere else, and Jewish people live somewhere else. And um, we're still paying for that. Um, and there is still um, redlining that occurs. It's just not called that anymore, right? It's, um, it's when the telecom industry is allowed to decide where it puts broadband because people can afford it and people can't. Uh, and those kind of services. And we know from COVID how important broadband is, right? And now we are like redlined on broadband, you know, which by the way, we said the city of Dayton elected said 10 years ago when they did it, that's what they were doing. And now the chicken has come home to roost on that. So we have significant challenges and issues on this work. Um, the first thing is, you know, we have, um, uh, I, I don't think you can work on a problem unless you declare the problem and state the problem. And so, uh, you know, this, uh, this time of uh, real social action around the death and murder of Joy George Floyd has given us great opportunity to really open up what can we can do better around police reform and police efforts. Uh, but it goes deeper than that. We've declared racism as a public health emergency as a city and are starting to work on issues. And we have been working in, in some fashion, but really around breaking up systemic racism and efforts from um, housing and 
uh, criminal justice and education and, and food security, you know, these issues that just envelope um, our black community uh, pretty heavily in Dayton. Uh, Dayton, I think during this summer has been interesting to watch and it's across the country. Um, of course, if you are black in Dayton, you know racism exists. Of course, like you experience it every day of your life, right? It is just laid on you every day. The white people of Dayton woke up in June and said, oh my God, racism exists. I can't believe racism existed. And that's great that we've had an awakening. Uh, there's a lot of education that needs to go on. I'm amazed at um, our black community on their patience with, with, uh, <laughs> with white folks. Uh, and, um, and there's great opportunity in that too. But like that, I think it really is kind of what's happening in communities across the country. And certainly that's happening in Dayton. And white people, um, uh, almost like their hair is on fire over it because they just realized it. And how can you all be living like with this challenge every single day, you know? So, I mean, there's, there's love in that, but there's a challenge of like bringing it all together. So I've been, super grateful to the black community of Dayton as we work on this issue and their patience uh, with the whole community on it is uh, is quite a blessing. Uh, but Dayton, like, look, I, I'm very proud of our city council and our elected leadership. Um, you know, even back in 2010, we declared Dayton an immigrant friendly community. We were picketed um, nationally because of it. Uh, we were considered the most welcoming, the first welcoming community in the country. And I always say, and the commissioners agree, that our, our mantra is, you know, you are, you know, you are welcome in Dayton, no matter who you love, what you believe, or where you come from, you are welcome in Dayton. What's key for us is the people that have been in Dayton for a few generations need to feel welcome here too. And so that is, I think, the work that is, that we are undergoing. Um, and that it will be painful uh, for folks and, you um, it will be impatient and patient, um, but it will be one of the most important things that we do long term to really dismantle some of these systems that have long been set in place to keep uh, white people up and black people down. It, it still hits home every time uh, because, like you said, you know, black people experience racism every day. Like I've been profiled before by police. I've been stopped by police before. Um, I've, you know, said it on social media. You know, it's kind of sad, but I have to ask myself the question, like, am I next? You never know. Mm -hmm. So um, Darius Beckham actually helped me uh, formulate this question because I really wanted to ask you about it, uh, especially because we're seeing, you know, from George Floyd to, you know, Breonna Taylor, Philando Caso, Trayvon Martin, we can, we can go on and on and on with the names. And obviously recently with Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're seeing Black people around the country unjustly killed and brutalized, you know, by law enforcement. What, you know, is being done in Dayton to create whether it be police reform or just fighting social injustice in general. So a couple, a couple of things, and I knew uh, you had to know Darius too, since we grad. He's like, is he two years ahead of you or one year ahead? Of two, you? Years, two, two years, two years. Okay, so he's uh, he's a couple years older. You know, he turned he turned twenty three. Uh, for everybody that's watching, Darius uh, works for me at City Hall and uh, uh, was very active at UD and. Um, uh, and you guys are so young now, Ian, that I said that um, I, when he turned 23, I said, nobody likes you when you're 23, Darius. And that's a Blink-182 song from the 90s, you know, when I was 20. Uh, uh, so that what we've been doing is um, a couple of fronts. Number one, immediately after George Floyd, uh, there, was this op there is this opportunity to look in and, and really uh, look at Dayton and what we can do better with our police department and our community. And so we put together these five areas for police reform, uh, where we have over a hundred people, uh, particularly community people that have been impact are, that could be impacted by police. So black people are a priority on these committees around use of force. Uh, each commissioner runs uh, each each working group. Use of force, um, the appeals process for uh, citizen complaints. Uh, around uh, training, you know, how our officers are trained, how our officers are recruited, and community engagement. And so uh, over 100 people in the community are engaged in these, having these conversations. This is very difficult because we're doing it via Zoom because of COVID, uh, but um, the attendance has been uh, phenomenal. Uh, and I think we'll see changes uh, to the policies of the police department because of that. We have to recognize too that we're trying to change culture in police departments as well. Uh, that has to do with both the lack of diversity in police departments and uh, both uh, 
uh, for blacks in police departments, but also women, right? These are pretty alpha male dominated places. Um, and studies show over and over again that if you put women on the force that um, uh, number one, they just de-escalate the men and uh, overall the, de the, the escalation of police go down. You know, there is a thing called testosterone. And so like trying to manage that with some uh, um, women that are interested in that. So that can mean that, that we recruit in different places. Maybe we recruit where people are becoming social workers or nurses um, because we have to, we have to think uh, the, the, what has happened to police departments over the past 50 years is uh, we have stopped funding children's services. We have stopped funding um, uh, ser social services, domestic violence services. We've stopped funding them. And the only, fun only thing that is left is police. And so when you have any issue, police are called because they are the only ones there. And so we have a couple of choices as community members and as Americans, do we start funding these things? Do we, you know, do we not have social, social services only open eight to five? Well, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense when a lot of the issues happen at midnight or two in the morning. You know, what would a 24 seven social work effort look? And the chief and I have talked about how could we, you know, really change culture around what if, what if in every police car, there was also a social worker in that car with the police officer? What if that was their partner? Um, I think that could really change the culture overall. And what if, and we saw this with opioid addiction, when um, police kept on running into accidental overdose and had nowhere to put folks but the jail, which made no sense, so they detoxed at the jail, they said, okay, we are gonna have a 24 hour, seven day a week mental health service place for addiction services. And so the police then could take folks to that location. We've done this before in small areas. What if we did that over the whole system? Uh, that requires not just Dayton, but it requires the federal government and the state government to participate in that because those are all different funding sources to rethink how we really provide services to this community and our community across a whole. So, um, and, and you know, frankly, in my poor neighborhoods, the only service they see are police services. They don't see any other services. That's a challenge, you know. And so I, I you know, I really don't believe the question is a, an issue of less money, it's an issue of more money in these communities. The second thing we're doing, as I mentioned, is not just around police, but about racism as a public health emergency. We're doing the collective impact model. It's something we've had much success in Dayton working on when we work these ways, on having hundreds of nonprofits come together you know, declare racism a public health emergency, you can get to this table and work with us to dismantle these systems that aren't just about police, but criminal justice overall, the court system, um, health, health insecurity, um, food insecurity, uh, education, you know, telecom, all of these issues, these, these systems are racist. How do we break them apart? And what can we do uh, when we recognize it to just not say, well, that's just the way it is? Right, 100%. Um, and especially, you know, with all that going on, the one thing you need to bank on, and I think you do a great job with is, you know, supporting others. So, and, you know, finding ways to lift people up and inspire others. So I think we're almost out of time. So this probably would be the last question is, you know, what are the ways in which, you know, the University of Dayton community, whether it be young people, staff, anybody, just a part of the University of Dayton community, uh, what can they do to support the city of Dayton? Well, first, you can consider staying in the university, staying in Dayton, Ann. Uh, no, uh, of course, we want uh, our young people to stay in Dayton. Uh, the students, um, I know there's lots of efforts in post-COVID times to, you know, uh, engage, whether it's um, volunteering and the volunteer efforts that campus ministry does. But we've really, we've been really excited, for example, with this flyer that we're doing, where you can have free, free, um, free to downtown through the bus, the flyer, uh, every 10 minutes, the flyer moves uh, through downtown. And we're trying to encourage the people of the university to explore past the bubble. We recognize you want a bubble right now because of COVID, it will be over. And so then after that, how we really uh, mingle and, 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 and um, have share, have share each other's experiences will help both the university and the city grow. Uh, for the alumni, you know, uh, supporting the University of Dayton, it is our flagship for the city. You know, we are linked. Uh, we're in each other's names. Um, and I, I always say that um, I talked to the UD men and women's basketball teams last week. And um, I tell the story. I told them the story. I think it's funny. 
uh, when I was first elected mayor in 2014, I don't know if uh, people remember, that was the year that we went to the Elite Eight, the men's basketball team went to the Elite Eight. Uh, it was a very big deal in the city. Uh, you know, the city was just um, gobsmacked over this team that went. And I had been in uh, mayor for like a hot hundred days and um, when March Madness started. And uh, folks would uh, uh, come up to me and they'd say, uh, Nan, congratulations, way to go. And so I talked to a dean at the university. And I said, this is so crazy. I have nothing to do with uh, this UD men's basketball team. You know, I go, I went to a couple games, you know, it's not like I've as mayor, you know, had any sort of impact. And they said, oh, Nan take the credit because you'll get the blame too. <laughs> and so I think that's that's true when when uh, UD does well and you champion UD, you're championing the city. And you know, it's something we're very proud of. And that's a great way that you're helping is, you know, talking about uh, a Dayton in a positive light in your, in your circles, um, not being disparaging of a mid-sized city in the middle of the country that, you know, if you're an alumni, you know, probably, and you're on this call, it's probably been some of the most formative years of your life. Um, mm -hmm. Celebrating that uh, is really, really important and being proud of that and sharing that uh, is I think important for the growth of our, our city. Uh, and if folks are interested in ways that they can help the city in more meaningful ways, uh, they can always reach out to me. Um, I'm an email away, uh, please. I look at all my emails personally, so just reach on out. Yeah. I, for one, saw, you know, big sports guy. You know, I've, apparently I have a podcast and a blog if you want to go check Yes, that. I can kind of tell <laughs> you're a sports guy just from this <laughs> conversation. <laughs> but you mentioned the basketball team, and I really believe that they were, you know, a, a, a ray of hope for, you know, the city, especially, you know, going through, you know, the tragedies of the tornadoes and shooting. I mean, we had the best, you know, Dayton team in, you know, school history going 29-2. Sadly, we're not going to talk about it, but March Madness didn't happen. I know. But, oof, That's so the worst rough. thing. That's the worst thing that COVID took, right, is the yeah. March Madness. I think somebody, my brother, my brother went behind me at UD two years, two years behind me, and uh, hey, he's a huge Flyer fan. And, um, when, when it was happening because we had the shooting we had the tornadoes and then and then COVID happens and then uh march madness is canceled and they said oh man that is so dayton i was like that's so terrible <laughs> it was just like dagger dagger <laughs> for our bad luck Whew. Yeah. but the team that team that uh, the 2019 2020 the 2020 team uh gosh they were great to watch and um i since you're a sports person I really loved the parody Twitter account for Obadiah. You know what I'm talking about? Where he acted like he was from the South and he was writing his mother. <laughs> I retweeted that. I loved it so much. And by the way, that parody Twitter account, because he's getting ready for his, it's, it's back up. So yeah. you, should, you should check it out. You know, it's funny because I actually know who runs it. And he wants to stay, he wants to stay anonymous. I wish oh, I could Oh, man. <laughs> Will you tell him, like, I am a huge fan of that Twitter account. Oh. <laughs> Oh, it was definitely something to see throughout this season. It was, it was incredible. But um, Mayor Namely, thank you so much uh, for taking the time uh, to, for this open and candid conversation. I feel like the nation, not even just Dayton, but the nation needs more of these uh, discussions. Any you know, last insights you would like to share before we wrap up? No, uh, Ian, I really hope you consider staying here. It's really great to, to talk to you. And um, I'm excited to check out your podcast. And I hope you'll stay in touch with me too, because it's been really great to have this conversation with you. Thank you. Thanks for all you're doing for Dayton. No doubt. No, and, and thank you as well for everything you do for Dayton now, in the past, and in the future. Um, I would like to also thank everyone else for joining us. Um, I hope everyone stays safe. Please wear a mask, social distance. It works. Um, and have a great evening, and go Flyers. Go Flyers!